chapter 24 is pretty easy for you guys, I think, to read and follow along. So I'm just going to go through the hit the high points pretty quickly. Um, it's also all in your outline from up to the outline says it's the 26, but it actually so far is only to chapter 24, which is what you need for the quiz today. So it should be fine. Um, I was going to share my screen with you, except hmm, I don't know that I have these PowerPoints, so you're going to have to indulge me for another minute here. Well, I got Hopefully, I. I can share my screen now. Um, no. All right, I have to go open this file first. Sorry. Okay, can you guys see that? Yes, no? Can somebody drop me a chat and let me know? Yeah, yeah? okay, great. Okay, so then let's, um, oh, I just to check if I, let, if I gave Melissa recording privileges, okay, she doesn't record. Okay, so let me minimize that. All right, so today is chapter 24, it's called Origin of the Species or Origin of a Species. And this uh, panel, I would start with because it shows um, two things that we need to balance when we're talking about what is a species. They're, these are actually two separate species, but you can see how very similar they are. This is, of course, a single species, and you can see all of the differences between members of that species. So in biology, the biological species concept is considered um, the, that a group of individuals in a population can interbreed and produce fertile offspring, which of course is the case if any of these individuals um, mated and produced children. By the biological species concept, these two organisms, even though they're very similar, are considered different species because they do not produce um, fertile offspring or offspring that can then reproduce themselves. So that brings us to talking about what keeps species separate, and we divide those into prezygotic barriers and postzygotic barriers. Um, your textbook moved the alternative species discussion uh, to after this. In the older edition of the book, they had it first. Um, just be aware there are different definitions of species concepts, particularly based on organisms like plants or bacteria. In the case of bacteria, there's no sexual reproduction, and in the case of plants, they can self-fertilize. So they are somewhat outside the bounds occasionally of the traditional biological species concept. But the rest of the chapter, we're going to focus on the biological species concept. So here we have the prezygotic barriers and the postzygotic barriers and some examples of each, which are good, good sort of good stories to tell, right? So if you look at the prezygotic barriers. Habitat isolation, that's pretty self-explanatory. These are two flies that feed on different fruits and lay their eggs on different fruits. These, I believe, on horn, hawthorns and apples, and these flies on blueberries. You can see how similar they are in appearance, but because they use different fruits for where they lay their eggs, they usually do not uh, mate with each other. Okay? Um, this is the case sometimes with snakes that are some that are predominantly terrestrial and some that are predominantly uh, water snakes that live in the same area, but um, like geographically, but their habitat within that geography is isolated. Also, you can see a lot of examples of this in the rainforest, where technically they're sort of in the same um, ecological space, but they um, may feed on different organisms or um, have such specializations that they are only you know, using some of the fruit in the uppermost canopy of the 
rainforest or down on the ground. Temporal isolation, this means isolation between reproduction in time. And you can see for this example, they've chosen some skunks. And I'll just look at which skunk is which. But um, one of these skunks is panel C is the western spotted skunk, and panel D is the eastern spotted skunk. And their geography overlaps, but they mate at different times of the year. So one of them mates in winter time, and they're looking for mates in winter, while as this one is looking for mates in summer. So they rarely breed, interbreed with each other because that's not when they're normally um, in heat or looking for a mate. Next, we have behavioral isolation, and this can be anything you can think of. Um, a song, if you're a bird, uh, a call, maybe if you're a cricket or a frog. And a very dramatic example is the blue-footed boobies of the Galapagos Islands. They do a particular dance. And I would recommend that you look this up on YouTube, type in blue-footed boobies. And there's a great video that shows uh, a male doing the dance and also presenting the female with some twigs, like, hey, I can not only dance, but I can make a good nest. And the female turns away, right, looking for a different mate. Their feet actually get bluer during the mating season. <coughs> Excuse me. And there are also red-footed boobies um, that have a similar um, behavior. So anything that is um, a behavior that, like I said, that you can think of. Fish sometimes have to, they swim in a certain pattern. Um, fertilization is often external with fish, but only if a fish swims the correct pattern will the female uh, lay, drop her eggs so the male can fertilize them. Like I mentioned, songs calls uh, fireflies because it's getting to be summertime, uh, lightning bugs. They actually flash different patterns for different species. Oh, sorry, Aloma. Um, they actually flash different patterns for the different species and that's how they know to mate with someone of their own species. So that would be considered a behavior. All the three that we've talked about so far, habitat, temporal, and behavioral isolation, notice those are all prior to a mating attempt. So these are all barriers that would even keep one of these species from even looking or considering the other one. The last two prezygotic barriers focus on if there's been a mating attempt, but it is not um, productive, let's say. And sadly, I think this is a great example of mechanical isolation. We have these, which literally means the parts don't fit. We have these two snails that look very similar, but believe it or not, one of them has a right turned shell and the other has a left turned shell. It's called torsion. And what that does is it puts um, their reproductive parts, you see they're highlighted here in opposite places. So these two snails are coming up to each other and they're trying to mate, but their reproductive parts don't align and so they can't exchange sperm. Oh, how sad, right? Another uh, post-mating prezygotic barrier is gametic isolation and this has to do with um, the sperm cells or the pollen grains not being able to penetrate the egg or the ovule. So we have an example here with sea urchins. You can see there's some purple ones and some red ones and notice they're growing right next to each other and this has to do most specifically when the sperm are released into the environment and the waves wash over these sea urchins. Only the red sperm can break down the zona pellucida around a red urchin's egg and the purple sperm can only break down, only has the right enzymes to break down and penetrate the purple egg. So that would be an example of gametic isolation. Right? If all of those barriers are crossed and some organisms still try to reproduce, even though they don't live in the same place, they don't mate at the same time, they have different behaviors, there are also what we call post-zygotic barriers. So this would be post-mating attempt and post-fertilization that can also help keep species separate. And there's only three of those, reduced hybrid viability, reduced hybrid fertility, and hybrid breakdown. 
So let's take a look at each of those real quickly. This is a larger picture of that. So the first is reduced hybrid viability. And we have a little salamander here. And I believe his situation is um, in that he is uh, sort of malformed and um, is not go is going to fail to thrive, people usually say, right? And this can happen actually before birth or after birth. Um, I just wrote down fail to develop or after birth, they are weak and we would say they fail to thrive and reproduce. Next, we have the case where the offspring is actually fertile or sorry, actually sterile. And this is a picture of a donkey. So when we have a horse that mates with a mule, so here's the horse and here's the mule, you get a donkey as a result and the donkey is sterile. So the donkey does not produce uh, viable sperm or eggs. Um, I believe they also, in your textbook, put the opposite situation. So for the, the donkey, it is the offspring of a male donkey and a female horse is a mule. And it's the mule that is, uh, sorry, put the wrong picture up there. So this is the donkey who can mate with other donkeys and produce fertile offspring. This is the horse, but the cross between them produces a mule and the mule is sterile. If you cross uh, the, the organisms the opposite way, uh, which is called a hinny, which is not, we don't have a picture of that, but when we have a female donkey and a male horse, hinnies are also sterile. So no matter which you choose as the male or the female, the resulting organism um, is sterile and can't leave any offspring. So if you want more mules, you have to keep crossing donkeys with horses. And lastly, we have what is known as hybrid breakdown. And this is a situation where, um, I believe these are pictures of some uh, rice and the hybrids. So let's see. The hybrids between them are vigorous and fertile, left and right. But when the hybrids reproduce with themselves or you cross the hybrids, you get this one in the middle. So we call that hybrid breakdown, meaning the second generation. Um, so the first generation is very robust and can produce offspring, but the offspring they produce in that second generation are weak and sometimes don't produce seeds. If you think about any kind of plant that we have as an annual, that would be an example of hybrid breakdown. Uh, many seeds that we use for crops, that's also usually an example of hybrid breakdown. They've been selected for artificially to produce big ears of corn or big tomatoes, whatever. And, and then the second generation, if you try to save those seeds, if they're not an heirloom variety, and you save those seeds and you try to plant those, the next year you don't get a very uh, strong crop. All right, so. With all of those barriers, then how do we ever get a new species, right? So these were all barriers, remember, that we would talk, we would discuss in terms of keeping species separate in terms of the biological species concept. So then the question becomes, how do we form a new species? And there's two major mechanisms. Actually, I think I would say there's three that we talk about now. Allopatric speciation, sympatric speciation, and what we know now known as a hybrid zone. Allopatric speciation, allo for other, means other geography. So there's a geographical barrier or an other country, a barrier between a population that's going to cause an accumulation of traits that are going to turn these two into separate species. And then after a period of time, if they are allowed to reunite and try to reproduce, again, they're not going to produce fertile offspring. So here's a pond or a lake, and we have, um, sh sure, Sam, give me a second. We have a bunch of fish, and the fish get divided, the pond gets divided into two, and then we have development of a new species over here because all their genes are separated from um, the main population. Find all of you guys again. Uh, I don't see you on my list, Sam. There you are. Yes. Great. I guess you can just leave me up there. 
Okay, so that's allopatric speciation. It's a separation by geography. Uh, your book gives another example, I believe, is of some um, small shrimp. Uh, here they are in different parts uh, around the Isthmus of Panama, uh, some crustaceans, right? And this would be a geographical barrier because they can't get across from the land mass from one side to the other. Sympatric speciation is a little more complicated, same country, um, and there's three main mechanisms of sympatric speciation, and most of them have to do with some sort of um, consequence to the alleles, to the chromosomes. So the first force of sympatric speciation is something we refer to as polyploidy, and this is when um, an organism has an extra, has extra chromosomes. If the extra chromosomes come from the same species, we refer to it as autopolyploidy. If they come from a different species, we call that allopolyploidy. So this is an example of species A mating with species B. Notice that species A has 2n equals 6, so they have three different chromosomes. Species B, 2n equals 4, so they have two different chromosomes. When those form gametes, they're going to form a zygote that has five chromosomes, right, which is going to, um, that's going to be an uneven number, so most likely it's going to be sterile. However, if there's a mitotic or meiotic error during this sterile hybrid's life, it can produce duplicate chromosomes, and now 2n is going to equal 10, and 10 we can divide evenly. evenly. So then this would become a fertile hybrid. Uh, I think this is an actual example of that happening in some flowers. And again, if the extra set of chromosomes come are derived from the same species, we call it autopolyploidy. If they're derived from a closely related species, we call that allopolyploidy. Another force for sympatric speciation can be uh, sexual selection. So this is this story from your book about the um, cyclids in Lake Victoria and how due to pollution, there were two species and now they both see each other as potential mates. So it's an example of a lot of different things because the reproductive uh, barriers of, I guess we would say, of temporal isolation and probably also gametic isolation have been overcome. Right? So this is reproduction causing new species to be formed. I think this is the new one, right? So these are the original species. I think these are the what they look like under orange light. And then I think this is the new species developing. And I guess they're just individual. They're just showing you the bigger ones. I think the picture in your textbook has a little bit better um, description of that. The hybrids between these two species are all fertile. Right? So we're getting a, a sort of an, a sexual selection. And we would also consider this a habitat. Uh, no, the, the last one would be habitat differentiation. And the example your book gives of that is when a subpopulation uses a resource not um, used by the parent population or the main population. And the example your book gives is the a pest of apples. And the fly's original habitat was on the hawthorn tree, but um, later, the um, some of the offspring were able to feed on regular apples and so that was an example of hybrid of habitat isolation or differentiation and forming a new species in the same country right so they're not separated by geography they're in the same place they're just using different food sources and the third type of development of a new species or speciation is what we call a hybrid zone and this example is with two toads. We have the yellow-bellied toad and the fire-bellied toad. And you can see this is Europe, right? So you can see Italy and Russia there, right? And you can see that through here, this red line is the hybrid zone. On the orange side, you only have fire-bellied toads. And on the yellow side, you only have yellow-bellied toads. The hybrid zone is where they mate occasionally and form fertile offspring. 
there are three potential outcomes for the hybrid zone. Okay, distance is very small. Notice it's only like the distance between that the size of the hybrid zone is very small, right? It's 10 kilometers. And they're toads, so they can hop or swim from one place to another. Three possible outcomes of the hybrid zone. Okay, so here's gene flow, here's the original population. Here's um, would be like the yellow bellied toads and the fire bellied toads, and here's the hybrids between them. Three possible outcomes reinforcement, fusion, and stability. And what you need to remember about this is they're discussing the outcomes of the hybrids on the, the parent species. So, one possible outcome is reinforcement, and we mean reinforcement of the original parents, and we don't get a new species to form. Another possibility is fusion, that the hybrids maybe are better suited to the environment than either of the parent species, and so we get a new species to form. Or the third possibility is what we call stability, where we have the two, it, we just keep the hybrid zone, and maybe it gets a little bigger some years, maybe it gets a little smaller other years. Sometimes the hybrid zone moves. Your book is giving some examples of hybrid zones moving based on global warming or climate change and organisms that didn't share a space before are now sharing a space because increased temperatures, they're moving further away from the coast or into different uh, areas of the forest. And I think that brings us back to the fish again, the turbid water fish, right? And so these are the hybrids. And in this case, this is a very famous study. If you like to read about someone documenting some microevolution over time, um, I think it's called Darwin's Dream Pond. And it's a Norwegian maybe writer, or maybe he's Swedish, I'm not sure. And he goes to Lake Victoria to study these fish and spends quite an amount of time there and then writes about um, his data and what he collects. How fast does speciation take place? Sort of depends. There's two uh, models, sort of two versions. One is called the gradual model, which like it sounds, slow changes accumulate over time. And then we end up with two species. You see this in the fossil record. You also see this model in the fossil record. It's called the punctuated model, or in older books, you might see it called punctuated equilibrium. This usually occurs when there is a dramatic climate change. So here's the original parent species in, in time. Notice time scale along the bottom here. In a relatively short time, we see a quick, a punctuated diversity of new species. And it doesn't have to be two. It could be three, four new species. And then some of these remain through time, and some of them go extinct. And we also see that in the fossil record. Mostly the punctuated model shows up right after or during those major extinctions. If you've already read to chapter 25, um, you know that we've gone through five, uh, the earth has gone through five major mass extinctions um, and people are predicting that we might be in the sixth. And so then again, some species are gonna go extinct because of the dramatic short-term climate change, maybe in, we're talking about, you know, history of the earth is four billion years. So 10,000 years or 100 years or 1,000 years is, is a short period of time. That would be enough to cause this punctuated equilibrium. All right, and then lastly, I love that your book tossed toss this in. Um, because of these different types of speciation that are more and more documented, of course, the molecular biologists are starting to get involved and they're actually starting to look at the genes, not just the numbers of chromosomes, but the actual genes on those chromosomes that um, contribute to speciation. So these are some flowers, I think, that have different hummingbird or different insects, maybe it's wasps. Um, and the change in the shape of the flower affects which pollinators are going to frequent the flower. And that's it for chapter 20, what is this again, 24, right?